My mother-in-law, Ruby Apple, tells me her greatest blessing is that she's always been content. She tells me this often, so I know it must be true. She never says, my greatest blessing is that I've enjoyed good health, or my greatest blessing is that I married well. Though she appreciates her good health and marriage, she is most grateful for contentment, knowing it's a rare bird. It's tempting to think there's a correlation between material abundance, ease of life, and contentment, but that's not the case with Ruby. She was born into a poor family, moved from home at the age of 15 to work as a housekeeper and attend high school. She's lived in the same small house since 1941, raised five children, worked alongside her husband on a patch of Indiana ground, was widowed while the children were still home, and describes her life with words like fortunate and happy. Where I see hardship, difficulty, and suffering, she sees strokes of good luck and blessing. If I didn't know any better, I'd think she wasn't right in the head, but she's the sanest person I've ever met. <laughs> I've known Ruby Apple 25 years. Once, during the early years of our association, I was seated at her kitchen table. Ruby was washing dishes and I was reading a magazine article about happiness. It contained a quiz the reader could take to gauge their well-being. I decided to test Ruby, so read her the questions and marked her responses. According to the quiz, she was supposed to be miserable. The man who wrote the quiz was a doctor of psychology, so I know he must be right. I keep expecting Ruby to face reality and be depressed, but she stubbornly insists on being cheerful. I'm not the jealous type, but I envy Ruby and her contentment. I'm always aiming for some elusive happiness and missing. Like most Americans, I'm guilty of thinking more stuff will make me happy. So I'm a vigorous gatherer of things that give me pleasure. Chairs, books, and pocket knives. I'm most content when I'm sitting in a chair reading a book. But the pleasure is fleeting. As soon as I get out of my chair, I'm prone towards discontent. Every month or so, I drive the 100 miles south to Ruby's home and take her to lunch. She lives in a remote part of the state. The local restaurants are unremarkable, but to Ruby it's all white tablecloths, silver and crystal. She orders the same thing no matter where we go, a chicken sandwich and a clear soda. In all the years we've done this, she's never been displeased. Ruby, how do you like your sandwich? Delicious. I once asked Ruby the secret of her contentment and she looked at me, thoroughly mystified. Secret? What secret? <laughs> Why are folks who think the least about contentment the most content? I suspect Ruby's secret is low expectations. She grew up in hardship, assumed most of her life would follow that pattern, so was surprised and grateful when good came her way. Too many of us approach life in the opposite manner. We believe the world owes us a great deal, are disappointed when it fails to deliver and think ourselves deprived. If life were mashed potatoes, we'd see the lumps and Ruby would see the gravy. Perhaps our headlong pursuit of happiness is the enemy. Since Ruby never believed the world owed her happiness, she's found it in small ways, in the slightest things, cultivating the wise habit of seeing the silver lining and not the cloud. This is a great irony. People who have every reason to be content seldom are. Though happiness is their aim, it seems always out of reach. I wonder if gratefulness is the bridge from sorrow to joy, spanning the chasm of our anxious striving. Freed from the burden of unbridled desires, we can enjoy what we have, celebrate what we've attained, and appreciate the familiar. For if we can't be happy now, we'll likely not be happy when.